Uh, thank you very much. Also, thank you very much uh, to the organizers. It's been very uh, great to see our Talbot exhibition here in Russia and also to learn more about uh, the local collections here. Um, so writers on photography from its early days up to today have long wrestled uh, with, how, with the questions with how the new medium's origins in the experimental science shape its relationship to the traditional representational arts, such as painting. So does photography belong within an integrated history of pictorial traditions, a feature that makes it particularly suitable for the art market, or does its status, its status as an automatic recording technique place it somehow outside of art? And in many ways, um, William Henry Fox Talbot who was, as we have already heard, both a prominent gentleman of science, but also an influential early voice on photographic aesthetics, represents an originary moment for this debate over the medium's aesthetic and evidentiary status. Talbot's invention appeared right at a time around the 1840s when the notion of art was in flux, shifting its meaning from craftsmanship to something sublime and aesthetic. Talbot's uh, independent invention of photographic process and his authorship of some of the most iconic images of early phot photography give him a monumental status in the history of photography. Sorry, how did this happen? Sorry. But also on the art market. Uh, only a few weeks ago, for example, you could see a Talbot print being sold at the French art fair a few months ago, uh, French art fair Paris Photo for 80,000 a thousand dollars per print. Yet for Talbot, photography was just one of many interests. His activities as a Victorian intellectual and gentleman of science wrangled widely across not only the natural sciences, but also many fields of classical and antiquarian scholarship. Soon Talbot became a keen decipherer of cuneiform. His participation in these fields is richly documented by the vast collection of research notebooks, correspondence, and other documents and objects that he left behind, as we have already heard from Kelly Wilder this morning. Yet Talbot began the photographic experience that would make him famous around 1833, presenting his invention to the world in 1839. He was most active as a photographer during this and the following decade, as many of you know. But by the in mid 1840s, perhaps surprisingly, he had given up working behind the camera and turned his attention almost entirely to other activities. Many art historians might thus be forgiven for assuming that Talbot spent 1839, the year when photography was announced to the public by Talbot's rival in France, de Guerre, entirely consumed by publicizing and perfecting his technique for photographic drawings. Yet, 1839 was also the year that Talbot published two important contributions to classical scholarship. The early months of the year 1839 would hardly see him spilling chemicals over photographs in a dark room. Instead, he'd perhaps be at a mahogany desk in the classical Victorian country house set a setting of Laycock Abbey, puzzling over the proofs of some of his publications in classical studies, a subject Talbot had studies alongside mathematics at Cambridge. So I'm showing you here a few manuscripts from the British Library collection. Um, on the top right, you see a very early one. And the ones um, on the bottom, they are from the 1840s. Uh, this one on the bottom is from the 1840s, or 1836. Um, the one on the left, um, the astronomical one, is also a very early one when Talbot was still a pupil. And the one on the top is um, a herbarium that he collected together with, with his mother. I'm just holding on a minute because it's not in my manuscript. You okay? An exclusive, uh, an exclusive focus on photography makes his work on these antiquarian and scientific projects at this time seem puzzling. It makes photography appear more like one small episode in a nonlinear biography, which was already rich in visual creativity, embracing multiple media. It is not my point to write yet another triumphalist story as Talbot as an antiquarian. So what interests me more here is how the diversity of objects and documents that Talbot produced 
comprising not only of photographs, but also of notebooks, letters, and even natural specimens, invite us, uh, on the one hand, to look more closely at the place his photographs have subsequently found in archives, institutions, and on the art market. So I will first give you insight into my previous research on Talbot to problematize the standing um, his um, photographs have gained over time on the art market. And to understand how they gained this status in the first place, it will then be necessary to look into the historiography of photo history and art history. And finally, we will have a closer look at the history of purchase of Talbot prints by the museums, all factors that ultimately led to their irresistible economic increase um, of market value. In particular, Talbot's notebooks invite us to see his photographs in a new way. So for Talbot, objects were registered on paper as photographs, just as thoughts were registered in letters and notebooks. So his archive is also an indication of what he thought was worth recording. Here, for example, um, you can see this quite nicely. You have a notebook um, um, where he's uh, trying to decipher a cuneiform tablet. But on the top, um, a photograph, on the top right, a photograph by Roger Fenton, not by Talbot, because at that time he already stopped taking photographs. You can see Talbot's handwriting on the photograph. And here he's actually trying to decipher, again, a tablet, but with the help of a photograph of a cuneiform tablet. And uh, on the left, you see a tracing, so a drawing of a, of a cuneiform tablet. So it's m various media that are involved in, in his decipherment um, endeavors. So in other words, Talbot used different tools, and photography was just one of them. Talbot's photography is thus not an isolated, isolated attempt to make images, but part of a rich scholarly life in which reproduction and recording always played an important role. So what I'm saying here is that Talbot's photographs cannot be reduced um, purely to iconography, but must also be understood as a witness of scientific and scholarly concerns, just as the notebooks. The notebooks, however, I should add, are not nearly as successful on the art market, but in most cases ended up as donations to public libraries. But this disconnect is unjustified. So... By considering his photographs and his notebooks as complementary tools, we find that many of Talbot's early uses of photography concern new methods of inscription, recording, classification, visual display, collection, and above all, reproduction. I think um, this comes across very nicely in the exhibition here uh, in, your, in the museum. That is to say, notwithstanding the fact that the photographs clearly are of aesthetic value, this aesthetic value was generated by an idea targeted in the light of his scholarly activities, rather than by the achievement of a picturesque work of art for its own sake. Talbot's understanding of photography as a means to making appealing pictures was certainly guided by the cultural and aesthetic values of his class, but we will fail to understand these value, values if we remain focused solely on how we, he engaged with the aesthetics of pictorial production in the fine arts, such as his adoption of rhetoric suggestive of picturesque or romantic aesthetics in a small handful of publications on photography. So the open door or the haystack um, from the pencil of nature, for example, may indeed allude to a familiar, familiar iconography, as some art historians have argued, However, in doing so, these pictures also engage with a concern with detail and accuracy with distinguished Dutch painting from works of art from other geographical areas. Talbot experimented with visual challenges using familiar iconographies and traditions to shape and foster a new image-generating device. Other Talbot photographs valued for their composition and aesthetic appeal can likewise be read as rigorous experiments to negotiate how photographers could tackle specific technical challenges, such as the depiction of scale. So the open door or the ladder, for example, explore how distance, shadows, and associative relationships can be depicted through chemistry. So the iconicity, iconicity of Talbot's photographs is thus de determined by the experimental trials 
um, of how things are depicted in a photograph, depicted in a photograph, and by their information content. So rather than negotiating the aesthetic value of Talbot's photographs that determines its economic value, I seek to amplify the idea of how these images and consequently their archival home could be defined. Aesthetic value can generate knowledge and vice versa. So aesthetic value can provide useful avenues to communicate uh, knowledge, while knowledge can be a way to catalyze aesthetic visual effects. Even when Talbot made works of art subjects of photography, for example, he did so by turning them into objects of study and experiment. And in doing so, he both diminished and increased their status um, as works of art. With the photographs of Pat Patroclus, for example, Talbot had immediately counteracted claims of lifeless mechanical self-inscription. Therefore, the question is not whether Talbot wanted more objective pictures in opposition to graphic art. Rather, we must, be ask, uh, we must ask how representation functioned for Talbot and what happened uh, once various forms of reproduction and thus representation interacted with each other. So although for Talbot photography was a means of reproduction and copying, in the pencil of nature, he initially introduced photography as an interpretative and thus epistemological tool determined by a gaze directed by a specific guiding interest. Finally, there are the photographs that are often disregarded by many art historians. Um, and I was happy to see that um, that's actually not true for the exhibition here um, because they these kind of materials, they were included. Um, mon many of them are photographers, and others depict flat objects, and they do not face the challenge of three-dimensionality seen in the examples I have just given, which is why usually they do not appeal to historians of art and photography, curators and collectors. Well, I'm obviously very general here, but it's true for, for many um, of the crowds I'm mentioning here. And yet they are very salient examples for Talbot's uh, key concerns, the recording of information as well as the depic depiction and circulation of uh, information. They touch upon the realms of reproduction, the archive and the museum, and as it is often the case with the objects Talbot photographs, they do so in a complex fashion. So Talbot's idea of copying implies that copying creates transformations of one object into another. And for Talbot, this is the precondition for turning objects into objects of study distinct from their original context. They can now be taken home in a folder. They can be scribbled on. So the object becomes paper just as thoughts become letters in a printed book. And it's these photographs that are, for me, really the embodiment of what Talbot intended to achieve with his invention. So, if, if Talbot wasn't an artist um, in the first place, but a gentleman of science, um, then who has turned him into an artist? How did he become this superhero of the history of photography whose print prices are rising every year? I would like to argue that not the actual photographs, but their detachments from their original archival context and their circulation across different types of museums is what determined disciplinary frameworks for studying Talbot's photographs. So we have to ask who purchased Talbot's prints in the first print place, which impact did their musealization have on the meaning of Talbot's images and for the history of photography at large? What are the categories we bring to an image? And when does Talbot and the connection with the history of art start? In the 1970s, art historians debated whether photography should be a, fee a field of art history of, at, uh, at all. And this period then saw its first history of photography professors in their art history departments appointed. During the 1980s, after the recognition of photo history in the academy and the museum, the field was shaken by postmodernist historical approaches that addressed the social, political, and economic context of photographs rather than considering them exclusively as a work of art. Sorry. Um, I would like to highlight here um, Abigail Salomon Godot's brilliant um, um, Carlo Tipomania essay, 
um, which um, appeared in this book here. So that's a piece of work in which uh, she critiqued an isolated art historical approach to the calotypes, the earliest paper uh, photography process Talbot used, in particular in relation to the value of calotypes uh, on the art market that became more and more aestheticized, fetishized, and economically profitable. This was in the 80s too. Um, soon, the study of photographic history then was swept up in debates which privileged a theoretical uh, methodology at the expense of a more historical approach. And then since the 1990s, new important scholarship emerged from fields such as anthropology and sociology, enriching our understanding about photography in many ways. And as a result, there was a shift towards practices, which then resulted in itself in a more revisionist history of photography. So people did not only look at uh, what photographs show, but also what they do and uh, what they are like as a material object, for example. And yet, um, despite of this, in spite of Colum uh, Solomon Godot's essay, and despite the fact that the battle has been won and photography had long become canonical in art history, Talbot remained, um, until today really, with some exceptions, oddly embedded in the art historical context, even though his complete archive shows entirely different stories. Um, so why is this? Photographic practitioners and Talbot scholars in the 1980s, such as Larry Scharf, Gail Buckland, Mike Weaver, uh, wanted to take Talbot seriously as a photographer and wanted to see him as an artist rather than as some learned gentleman, which was a great achievement um, at the time. But of course, there were pitfalls as well. So a whole discipline was built up around Talbot. Journals were funded so people can publish on him. But this has also led to an incredible rise of the value of uh, Talbot photographs. Critical interventions into this ecosystem have been met with suspicion. So for example, reactions to our 2010 conference, um, uh, which was a conference that yielded the publication that Kelly Wilder mentioned earlier, um, are symptomatic for a greater anxiety that I think has a lot to do with losing the category art as the default category photography. So for example, when we had our conference, there were people in the audience who said, but the photographs are so beautiful and they are so aesthetic. Um, and we had to say, yes, of course they are, but they also something else. Um, so I want to, um, to finish this up. I would like to... Uh, go back to um, the early 20th century and ask when museums started collecting Talbot, which because it plays a, an important role in this question. Um, so in, two, uh, in 1911, the Smithsonian's honorary custodian, a uh, section of photography, Smiley, regarded Talbot's, in, quote, invention of the photographic negative as the most important of all inventions in photography up to the present day, Therefore, he says, I am specially anxious to have him well represented in our museum, end quote. So having led the ground for the institutional interest expressed for the medium, Matilda Talbot, uh, Talbot's grand, uh, great-granddaughter, became one of the most active supporters of, her, uh, of Talbot's work and presented some material to the Royal Photographic Society in 1921. Um, and things very much took off in the 1930s, when in 1934, Matilda even organized um, a centenary exhibition in 1934 to celebrate Talbot's work in, at, in Lake Hook Abbey. And you can see some pictures of this, this um, wonderful exhibition here. In 1936, the Los Angeles Museum of History, Science and Art tells Matilda that her father deserves more credit for the invention of photography than Daguerre's, who is often given the honor. And then in the same year, the Science Museum corresponds with the Talbot families, a family. Others followed, including the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And interest continues in the 1940s. As a curator at uh, MoMA in New York, Newhall, who many of you know as the author of the first comprehensive um, history of photography, uh, builds a nucleus of photographs, and Matilda gives him two Talbot prints. 
many institutions follow in the in 1960s, such as the Smithsonian, while prices start to rise considerably. So to fast forward, the Smithsonian opened their own hall of photography in the late 1960s. And a quote by Harold White shows how Talbot starts to be reproduced, uh, reduced to a photography in 1966. Just to give you an estimate, in 1968, color type, a color type costed around um, $780. And in the eight, 1960s, the Talmany, uh, Talbot family then starts to feel the pressure to initiate a, a biography and a museum to study and ask for some prints to be returned to them, to Laycock Abbey. Um, in 1977, a biography was written um, that was supposed to be an all-encompassing overview of Talbot's skills. And yet again, all Talbot ended up becoming famous for was the foundation of photography. So this imbalance in our historical understanding of Talbot's work and thus the origins of photography is partly a result of the reorganization and specialization of the modern disciplines. No scholar today is likely to possess expertise in all the many fields to which Talbot contributed. And so when I catalogued um, his archives, I had to constantly ask, ask experts to come into the library and help me understand what they are actually about. Um, but it has also been powerfully reinforced um, by the disposition of his archival collections. So Talbot's photographs and the few notebooks that document Talbot's photographic innovations have long been separated from the vast bulk of his archive, that, which mostly documents his many other activities beyond photography. So um, what was made art and science, or what ended up on the art market as isolated fragments of an archive, and what did not, was not just the agency of actual photographs, but the processes through which museums and libraries have organized objects that lend themselves to interrogation in the light of archival science. They are now, for example, um, accessible to the public in the British Library as well as the Bodleian Libraries. Um, Talbot's scholarly and family papers, um, as I, I said, the cataloging of which I was involved in, and it is worth noting that the last of these uh, transactions took the route via um, an art photography dealer, while the first took the direct route from the fam family to the library. But while there are a few photographs in these archives too, the finest of all uh, Talbot photographic prints are not held uh, anywhere near his scholarly archive, but in national museums. Critiques added that um, the present uh, move to separate the independent aspects of the art and science of photography uh, reverses prevailing worldwide practice and takes the study of photo history in Britain back several decades. So this is a crit critique about separating um, science um, material from um, photography only collections. And so the science material tends to be in libraries, though that's also not entirely uh, true in much, some cases. And the photographs tend to be on the market, on the art market, and in museums. But isn't um, the irony of the intervention of scholars like myself precisely that no matter what we claim and, and write about Talbot and his uh, newly accessible scholarly documents, we too contribute uh, to this already existing discourse. Um, scholars, we must not forget, were never immune and innocent in this story. So um, in this paper, I problematize the fact that Talbot's photographs were over time and in close collaboration between Talbot's heirs, scholars and the museum and the art market, reduced to fine art squeezed into passepartouts, beautifully lit in white cube galleries and thus taken out of context. And in fact, I would claim that for Talbot, photography was more a matter of script than image, more of a matter of science than of fine art. And in short, though for Talbot, photography was a means of reproduction and copying, who initially int uh, introduced photography as an interpretive and thus epistemological tool, um, 
It was determined by a gaze directed by a specific guiding interest. And Talbot's gaze, of course, was that of an antiquarian who knew about the objects he photographed. So that's, that's it for, uh, from my side. And um, I'm, I'm here if you have any questions about any of the archives. Um, and also, I'm here as a kind of uh, representative for the Catalog Resonate project that Kelly Wilder mentioned this morning because Larry Scharf, unfortunately, can't be here today. Um, so, of course, they're always interested in making connections to any of you who have Talbot prints in their own museums. Um, so, yes, thank you very much. Thank you.